Good afternoon and welcome to the Days of All Revelation, Laying Bare the Foundations. Initially, we had scheduled a temple service for today, but of course, due to Hurricane Florence, we decided to cancel temple service and I'm doing the revelation that I was going to share um, live online, which of course will also be archived. So you can come back to this website. Uh, you can come back to our YouTube channel, Truth and Spirit Live to watch it later. Now, praise God that most of us in Tidewater haven't experienced too much. Like we lost a little bit of power in the middle of the night last night. Other people have had some rain, some flooding, but it's nothing like what we're seeing in North Carolina. There's been loss of life. Um, people are still flooded in, in certain areas in North Carolina. And so I want to ask that you pray with them and for them, uh, that God will minister to them, comfort them, rescue those that are in need of rescue even now, and that he minister to all of us because there's revelation in all that is happening even now. God is a perfect and great God. And so um, let us begin in prayer. We'll actually lift them up and then we'll lift up this revelation as well. And then we're going to look at what God wants to say today, um, doing these 10 days of all about laying bare the foundations. Hallelujah. Father, we lift you up and we worship you, Lord God. And we just praise you even now for speaking clearly to and through your servant, Lord. I ask that you cleanse me with the blood of Messiah and lead me in accordance with your will, that you put the coals to my lips, Lord that I can share the revelation that you've given me clearly, hallelujah, Lord, that it would minister to our hearts, Lord, and it would allow us to lay ourselves before you, that you can lay our souls bare, hallelujah, Lord, and remove everything that's not like you. We praise you for it even now, and we thank you for that. And I ask also, Lord God, that you be with the families that have been um, impacted by this storm. Those in the Carolinas, Lord God, those already who received it in the islands, Lord, we just ask that you minister comfort to them. Anyone in Virginia who's experienced um, challenges and calamity due to the storm, we just thank you that you comfort them, Lord, that those that are in need of rescue because they're flooded in. We thank you, Lord God, that you, that you rescue them even now, Lord. Uh, we, we bless you that you comfort families of those who have already lost loved ones, Lord. We ask that you minister to those that are sick and in danger. Hallelujah, Lord, for you are their rescue. We ask that you minister to souls even now, because that's even more important than our physical life, but our eternal life with you. We ask that you minister to souls, that people would draw near unto you, that they might be encouraged in their faith, that they might seek you while they can. Hallelujah, Lord. And turn to you in every way. We just praise you for that. We ask for a uh, ministry to our own souls during these 10 days of all that we might come before you honestly and in integrity, that we might confess our sins, Lord, that we might allow you to empower us to repent and turn of the, turn from those sins, but that you also would empower us to intercede on behalf of our cities and regions and nations, that you might cleanse them as well. We just praise you for it, and we thank you for that even now. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. All right, and so this again is the 10 days of our revelation. Um, and I'm sharing this because we are in the midst of the 10 days of all. We are in day six of the 10 days of all. And to, to give you a, an understanding, the 10 days of all start with Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah is the first day of all. The last day of all is Yom Kippur. And there are eight days between them. And so we start these 10 days of all um, reflections and, and prayers and decorations on Yom Teruah. And we will continue them through into Yom Kippur. And you won't find that phrase, the 10 days of all in the scriptures. It's not in the Bible because it is a Jewish tradition that has developed over the years because God demanded that we come before him on Yom Teruah. And he demands that we come before him on Yom Kippur. So the children of Israel have taken it upon themselves to be reflective all throughout that entire time from Yom Teruah through Yom Kippur. But then even the previous month. Um, which, of course, the last day of that previous month is the day before Yom Teruah. So the month that precedes um, this seventh month we're in, the sixth month, which is also called Elul, is a month of repentance as well. So the children of Israel have taken this very seriously because over the years they've really come to understand the seriousness of Yom Kippur. And so all of this is about preparing for that day. And Yom Kippur itself is about preparing for Sukkot. And so I want to take you to Leviticus chapter 23 so that you can see this progression from Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur, and then also Sukkot. And so in Leviticus chapter 23, we see Yom Teruah, the day of signing the shofar, also known as the, um, the Feast of, 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 of Trumpets, or the Festival of Trumpets. It starts in verse 24 of Leviticus, I mean, 23 of Leviticus chapter 23. And so it says, um, Adonai said to Moshe, or the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel in the seventh month, 
the first day of the month is to be for you a day of complete rest for remembering a holy convocation announced with blast on the shofar. Do not do any kind of ordinary work and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. Now that burnt offering or offering made by fire means that the Lord wants to minister deliverance to us. I do lots of teachings on the burnt offering, which is all about deliverance. But you see also that he says specifically the Yom Teruah, this day of, sh of sounding the shofar, of blasting that Teruah blast on the shofar, is a day for remembering. Now, what are we remembering? Now, for those of us who are believers, we know we have a promise. Yeshua told us that when we see uh, wars and we hear rumors of war, that we were to lift up our heads because our redemption is drawing near. So we are to remember the promise that Messiah is coming because he will fulfill Yom Teruah when he cracks the sky to the blast of a heavenly shofar, which we see in 1 Thessalonians chapters 4, um, chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Yeshua himself will return to the shofar blast, and it's an angel shofar with an, an with an angelic cry, and then he will crack the sky and return to earth, and then those who are dead in the Messiah will rise first, and then those who are still alive will meet the Lord in the air. So we, as believers on Yom Teruah, we are remembering that the Lord is coming. We are also remembering all that he has done for us. It is a time to remember God's goodness to us. It's a time to remember God's promises to us. It's a time to remember his purpose and plans for our lives. It's time to remember who we are in him. And so um, as I shared with you, we have declarations that we actually say on each of the 10 days of all, and they are accompanied by a scripture. And so the declaration for Yom Teruah, which is the first of the 10 days of all, is Lord, revive your work in me. And I shared with you all that the blast on the shofar literally does that. It will revive your identity in the Lord. It will revive your purpose. It will revive promises that God has spoken to you years and years ago. On Yom Teruah, when that shofar is sounded, it awakens the bride. It awakens us to our purpose and our identity in the Lord. And so we cry, Lord, revive your work in me. Now, after Yom Teruah, traditionally speaking, Israel does not blast the shofar again until after Yom Teruah. When the sun sets at the end of Yom Teruah, for those next nine days, is the, the additional eight days in the middle, and then Yom Kippur concluding the 10 days of all, there's silence. And, and it's just like we see um, written in the prophets, be still before the Lord, all the earth. And so this is what is happening. And the reason there's this stillness before God for, the, for these the remaining nine days is because we're reflecting on ourselves. We're allowing him to cleanse us. We're allowing him to minister to us because we're preparing for Yom Kippur. So let's keep reading Leviticus chapter 23 about Yom Kippur. And I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I want you to understand its purpose. Just like we understand Yom Teru is a day for remembering. And the shofar itself actually revives us to God's work. It reminds us of the things that he said to us and he's done in us. But Yom Kippur, we see in Leviticus 23 verse 28, is a day to make atonement. Specifically, it says you are not to do any kind of work on that day. Because it is Yom Kippur to make atonement for you before Adonai, your God. And it's very serious because he calls for us to deny ourselves. That's a complete fast. No food, no water, no work, no entertainment. He says anyone who doesn't do it is to be cut off from his people. There's a seriousness attached to Yom Kippur because he needs to address our sin. And he knows that over the, the, the past year, since the last Yom Kippur, we've accumulated all types of things. Meaning we have sinned against God in ways that we know that we've sinned and ways that we don't even know that we've sinned. But all sin opens a door for not only the enemy to attack us, but also for him to start to influence us. Additionally, we are influenced by people in our lives and the culture all around us, which if you will look around your culture today, I'm looking around at mine, there are influences of wickedness and sin and, and temptation all the time. There's witchcraft that is just blatantly before us, not just the adults, but even children. We see uh, satanic influences all throughout our culture. And so these things are bombarding us at all times. And then we've got, of course, the influence of the demons that want to uh, teach us how to be proficient in the sins that they catch us doing, the things that they observe us doing, or even the things they tempted us to do. Um, those demons come to try to whisper in our ear that we would continue the sins and become even more proficient at sinning so they can lock us into a downwardly spiraling cycle of sin, which is called a stronghold. 
Now, God is saying once a year, I want to deal with all of that. I want to deal with not just your sin because he deals with our sin as much as we will allow him to. Prayerfully every day, we're allowing God to deal with our sin, which is why the priest had daily offerings that they brought before the Lord, which you'll see in, in Numbers chapter 28. But there were also weekly offerings on Shabbat. There were monthly offerings on Rosh Hashanah, And then there were the seven annual offerings on these on these seven annual feasts, which you'll see again in um, Numbers 28 and Numbers 29. So the challenge for us here is not just that he wants to address sin, because we should be addressing sin regularly. But he is also addressing demonic influence, oppression, and possession. He frees us from demonic strongholds, not just on an individual level, because in our individual lives, he can do that every single day of the year because Messiah shows sacrifice. But Yom Kippur is a day set apart for national atonement, national repentance and prayer, national deliverance. And so in these 10 days of all, the nine days that precede Yom Kippur, we are preparing not just for our own deliverance, not just for the cleansing of our households, but also for the deliverance and cleansing of our nations. Now, this is key because he himself, he doesn't just want to use Messiah Yeshua. He doesn't just want our high priest to do all the work. He wants to use all of his priests actively as we are preparing for this day, as we are preparing for him to deliver our nation and specifically on the day of Yom Kippur, he wants to use all of his priests. And Peter has told us that we are a royal priesthood. So each one of us has this responsibility as believers to prepare to be useful to God and then to show up on Yom Kippur, having, you know, fasting, praying, repenting, focused in on the Lord, removing all distractions so that he can use us as intercessors to make a difference in our nation. Now, I've been teaching a lot out of Leviticus chapter 16. That is specifically on Yom Kippur. That entire chapter is about Yom Kippur. And it talks to us about the goat that for the Lord, which is a sin offering, and then also the goat for Azazel, which we in other versions it says the scapegoat, but in the complete Jewish it says the goat for Azazel, which is the demon upon whom it is written all sin. We see that in the book of Enoch and the Apocrypha. And so the Lord actually has the high priest pronounce all sin unto that goat for Azazel, also known as the scapegoat, and to send that goat out into the desert, dry arid places, so that the demons that are attached to our sins will be cast into dry arid places. In Matthew 12, Yeshua tells us when a demon goes out from a person, it goes into dry arid places seeking rest, but it finds none. That desert is a place of torment uh, for demons because they have no host. There's nothing they can do in the earth realm without a human because we've been given dominion on the earth. And so Yeshua tells us then they come back to their original host. And if they find the, if they find the house swept clean and empty, and look at that word empty a little later, then it will return with seven more demons, even worse, um, more wicked than itself. And the condition of the person is worse off. So they get a deliverance, but don't get refilled by the Lord. And their condition is even worse. Now, the reality is that that same um, concept is used also for nations. He sends the demons of nations into dry arid places so that the nations can be free of demonic strongholds and oppression and possession so that God's people can rule the nations righteously according to his righteous judgments. And we can have clarity of mind and thinking as we are interpreting and writing laws, as we're enforcing laws, as we are trying to lead people in our communities and regions and throughout the nation. Now, let me give you a scriptural reference for this. This is a place that I go to all the time about the importance of God's people really being on our post in this way, um, because we are his royal priesthood, and we have got to steward rightly the earth that he has made, given us dominion over. So here we are in Psalm 82. It tells us about this important responsibility we have and how what we do determines what happens here on the earth. And then we're going to connect that with um, Romans 8, because that also confirms it as well, that what we do um, in the earth realm really affects not just um, our lives, but the physical earth itself, which is why we're looking at the topic, laying bare the foundations. And so here we are in Psalm 82, and I'm going to read it out of the complete Jewish because you hear the Hebrew terms that are really important here. And it says, um, a Psalm of Asaph, Elohim, which is capital E, it's a name for God, which I share with you guys all the time, means judge and creator, because as a judge of everything, he's the only one who can rightly, uh, as the creator of everything, he's the only one who can rightly judge everything. So he, he, Elohim is judge and creator. So Elohim, God, 
stands in divine assembly there with the Elohim. It's the same word, but it's lowercase Elohim. And he judges. Now he is speaking to humans. Yeshua himself said that God was talking about humans. People often think it's talking about angels, but Yeshua said, if Elohim would say you are Elohim, then why are you accusing me of saying that I am one with God? If Elohim himself said that we are Elohim, that is what he's referring to. We are the Elohim. He's not speaking of angels. So he stands in the assembly, the divine assembly with the Elohim, the judges that he has set apart in the earth, who he's given his creative power to and his authority to judge. Um, he judges, verse two, how long will you go on judging unfairly, favoring the wicked? Give justice to the weak and fatherless. Uphold the rights of the wretched and poor. Rescue the destitute and needy. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They don't know. They don't understand. They wander about in darkness. Meanwhile, all the foundations of the earth are being undermined. My decree is you are Elohim, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, you will die like mortals. Like any prince, you will fall. Then the psalmist says, song, um, verse 8, rise up Elohim, and he's talking about God now, rise up and judge the earth for all the nations are yours. So he's saying clearly we're not doing a good job at this responsibility of judging the earth, as you have said, as pronouncing your judgments in the earth. We're not doing a good job, so we ask that you rise up and judge. Now the challenge to us is, is if God rises up and judges and we have not repented, then the judgment is against us rather than for us. This is why it's so important that we prepare for Yom Kippur because he rises up and judges as Elohim on Yom Kippur. So we've got to prepare for Yom Kippur that when he sees us on Yom Kippur, not only does he not see guilt in us, but we're also being the righteous judges in the earth that we are interceding on behalf of others. Why? Look at why this is so essential. Because he says in verse five that the foundations of the earth are being undermined. Now, other versions say that the foundations of the earth are shaken. This version says being undermined. What undermines the foundations of the earth? Well, God established the earth in righteousness and justice. So when humans to whom he has given dominion on the earth are acting unjustly and unrighteously, we undermine his righteous foundation upon which he set the earth. So we are actually affecting the earth realm when we sin and when we don't judge sin as sin. We are not to judge people because we didn't create people. Elohim, the big Elohim created people. He's the creator and he's the judge, which is why he is going to judge people. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But we are to judge actions. We're to judge Sin. We're even to judge motivations. Remember Yeshua said, oh, why do you have these wicked thoughts in your heart? He was judging their heart motivations. They hadn't even done anything yet. We're to make these right judgments so that people will know the difference between wickedness and righteousness. As priests, our responsibility, the Torah teaches that the priestly responsibility is to teach the difference between the holy and the common. If I am not speaking out, if I'm not sharing God's righteous standards, then that means I am actually judging favorably upon the wicked, which is the very thing he's convicting us of in Psalm 82. He said, how long will you go on judging unfairly, favoring the wicked? We favor the wicked when we don't say that is wickedness. We have to say that it's wickedness. We don't judge the people because only Elohim can judge the people. We judge the actions and we judge who's behind the actions. It's God behind those actions. So that means they are righteous and good actions and, and heart meditations or is the enemy behind those actions, which means they are unrighteous, unjust actions and heart meditations. Now, let us look at the fulfillment of Yom Kippur. And if you've been watching my teachings throughout this season, I've said this a few times, but it ties in very importantly as we're looking at laying bare the foundation. So I do want you to see the fulfillment of Yom Kippur. It is in Revelation chapter 20. This is when Yom Kippur is fulfilled. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Says, next I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing in front of the throne. Books were opened and another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead in it and death and Sheol, the place of the dead, gave up the dead in them and they were judged each according to what he had done. Then death and Sheol were hurled into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. 
anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was hurled into the lake of fire. That's the fulfillment of Yom Kippur, which is judgment day. So on that day, Elohim judges people. Until then, he requires that we, little Elohim, judge actions. Why? Because he needs the foundations to be laid bare. So let's go to Romans chapter 8. I want to show you the significance of what he is saying here. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to start um, at verse 16, but we're going to keep going down. So I need you to understand how we, God's people, little Elohim, how we affect the earth. So starting in verse 16 in the complete Jewish. The spirit himself bears witness with our own spirits, with our own spirits, that we are children of God. And if we are children, then we are also heirs, heirs with God and joint heirs with the Messiah, provided we are suffering with him in order also to be glorified with him. I don't think that the sufferings we are going through now are even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us in the future. The creation waits eagerly for the sons of God to be revealed. This is where we're talking about the foundations of the earth here. For the creation, that means the earth, was made subject to frustration, not willingly, but because of the one who subjected it. But it was given a reliable hope that it too would be set free from its bondage to decay and would enjoy the freedom accompanying the glory that God's children have. We know that until now, the whole creation, that means the whole earth, has been groaning as with the pains of childbirth. And not only it, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we continue waiting eagerly to be made sons. That is, to have our whole bodies redeemed and set free. Now, this is key, because at the fulfillment of Yom Teruah, when the heavenly shofar sounds and the angel lets out the, the cry in the heavenly realm, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, we will be caught up to with Messiah in the air and we will receive this redemption of our bodies, meaning we will get the transformed bodies the body Messiah has, where he can eat and walk through walls. We'll have that body. So the redemption of our bodies is fulfilled at Yom Teruah. In the meantime, we are walking toward this day as little Elohim, sons of God most high, that we are proclaiming his right judgments in the earth. Even when we don't understand, the spirit rises up in us in unknown tongues and in prophecies and revelations and in visions to reveal the unseen God in the earth realm that humans would know that there is a God who makes atonement for sins and separates us from the demonic oppression that we've opened our own selves up to by our disobedience so that he can not only restore us, but he can restore the foundations of the earth. The earth itself is groaning and waiting for us to turn back to the ways of God because just as the earth was cursed, by Adam's sin in Genesis chapter 3, the earth is redeemed as we receive the redemption that Messiah Yeshua himself has already paid for. Now, how does this relate to the 10 days of all? Yom Teruah is the first of the 10 days of all. The redemption of our bodies, the redemption of our identity, the redemption of our purpose, the redemption of who we are as Elohim working for God, all of that he revives in us on Yom Teruah. Now, Yom Kippur being the last of the 10 days of all is judgment day. It's fulfilled on judgment day, in which case it is the day where he does not want to judge against us. Yom Kippur literally means day of purging. He does not want to purge our names from the book of life. He does not want to purge us from his presence forever, as we see on judgment day. He instead wants to purge us of sin. He wants to deliver us from our own sins, consequences, and to separate us from every demonic influence, oppression, and possession that came as a result of our sin, not just individually, but in nations, whole nations. Now, look at the process that happens in between. I'm going to share with you what we declare during the 10 days of all. And this is on our website, truthinspirit.org, truthinspirit.org. If you go down and you'll see 10 days of all revelation, which is the very thing that I'm delivering to you right now. If you click on that, it's going to take you to a days of all page. And on that page are going to be the 10 declarations that we pray. You can't see this because of the light. 
but you'll see it on the website. It's actually, I think it's like blue um, and white and you'll see the 10 declarations, but I'm gonna read them in your hearing right now because on Yom Teruah, we declared, Lord, revive your work in me. And we blasted the shofars into each other. And that was based off of Habakkuk chapter three, verse two. The next day, which is another day of all, we now we're allowing him to minister to our own souls because what we're doing is after he's revived our identity and purpose, we've got to lay bare the foundation of our own souls. We have got to strip ourselves naked before him that he can do major surgery, which is deliverance, that he can prepare us for Yom Kippur. We don't just show up for Yom Kippur. There is a preparation process because on Yom Kippur, we're supposed to be interceding and praying because we should have already dealt with our sin as Elohim, as, as sons and daughters of the Most High God, as royal priests. We should already be dealing with our sin so that in Yom Kippur, he can use us to minister to our nation and the people around us. So after we say, Lord, revive your work in me, according to Habakkuk 3, 2 on Yom Teruah, the next day we say, Father, have mercy on me. Because now I'm looking at the foundation of my own soul. I'm looking at what's really going on underneath the surface, underneath all the religious exterior and all the things that I know to say and all the things I think are right to do. What's really down below the surface going on in my soul. And so I say, Father, have mercy on me, according to Psalm 51, verse 1, where David cried that the Lord would be merciful to him after he'd sinned with Bathsheba. The next day we cry, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Still Psalm 51, verse 10, where now David is asking God to create in him a clean heart and give him a right spirit. He says, renew a right spirit within me because he has been looking at his sin. He's been looking at it with open eyes and in a repentant heart. So then the fourth day we say, let your will be done in me. So I've looked at myself honestly, and now I'm asking God to have his way. Because even in my honest approach to my own sin, God still has to do a work in me that I may not be comfortable with so that he might address it. And that's according to Matthew 26, verse 39, where Yeshua is in the garden of Gethsemane. And he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, you have your way. Then there's verse five, I mean, day five of the 10 days of all, where we ask the Lord, Lord, show me your ways that I may know you. And this comes out of Exodus chapter 33, verses one, verse 13. And this is Moses asking, Lord, show me your ways. He asked to see God's face. He asked God to show him his ways because he realizes I can't even really turn from the darkness. I can't even turn from the sin. Because remember, Psalm 82, it says that the people of the earth stumble about in darkness. They don't even know what makes them stumble. And as they are stumbling about in darkness, it is not until we turn into the, the light of his countenance, the light of his face, that we're able to turn away from these sins. So Moses asked, show me your ways. And we're asking the same thing. Lord, let me know your ways on day five. Now, day six, which is the day we're on right now. We are on day six today. Today's cry is, oh, God, keep me from evil. And this comes out of First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. And that's out of the prayer of Jabez. And I'm going to read that in your hearing because we are on day six. Um, and it is very much connected to what we're looking at today, laying bare the foundation. So here we are in First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. And we're on day six of the days of all. And this is our declaration. Oh, God, keep me from evil. And so I'm going to read verses 9 and 10, and I'm reading in a complete Jewish. And in a complete Jewish, there's no J in the Hebrew language. So his name isn't Jabez in a complete Jewish, it's Yabetz, that's his name. So Yabetz was honored more than his brothers. His mother called him Yabetz. She explained, because I bore him in pain. His name means pain. Yabetz called on the God of Israel. Please bless me by enlarging my territory. May your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that it will not cause me pain. And other versions say so that I will not cause pain. Now, what he's asking is that the Lord rebuke evil from him. And Yeshua himself said, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And in essence, this is exactly what Yabetz or Jabez is praying. And this is what we're praying. Lord, keep 
us protected from the evil one. Don't let him infiltrate us in ways that we don't even realize. Don't allow ourselves to be unduly influenced. Don't allow us to be taken captive by sin and the enticement of sin. Instead, Lord, you keep me close to you and protect me from the schemes of the enemy and the schemes of wicked people around me who would set snares for my feet. And so we're praying that we be kept from evil, not just without, but also within. Let me not meditate on evil inclinations. Let me not think on evil thoughts. Let me not think evil things in my heart. Lord, let me not have evil motivations because as Elohim, I'm supposed to be a judge. I'm supposed to judge those things. I'm supposed to take those thoughts and make them captive and to they submit to the knowledge of Messiah Yeshua because anything that sets itself against Messiah Yeshua, I've got to take it captive. I got to pull it down. So I'm asking Lord that you keep me from evil, that you keep me in this right place with you and right standing with you, that I would not fall to evil schemes around me and not be subject to evil within my own heart motivations as well. Tomorrow, we will pray, Lord, give me peace. And that comes out of Numbers chapter six, verse 26, which is in the ironic blessing. So we're basically asking for the shalom of the priestly blessing. We're asking for shalom because if you have shown me your ways and you're keeping me from evil, I should be at peace because I'm in right relationship and right standing with you. The next day we ask, Lord, renew my strength. And of course, that comes right out of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, where we ask him, you know, those are the way upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We shall, we shall mount upon ease wings like eagles. We should run and not be weary. You should walk and not faint. This is where that, that uh, declaration comes from. It comes directly from that scripture. Um, and then and, uh, on the ninth day, this is the day before Yom Kippur, we're asking, Lord, fill me with your love. This comes out of Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 and not through 19, where Paul teaches the Ephesians to love one another rightly as brethren in the body. And this is a big deal because the next day is Yom Kippur. And our declaration for Yom Kippur is, Lord, give us boldness to declare your word. And I'm going to take you to the scripture that actually goes along with that because it, it connects with the revelation for today. So here we are in Acts. We're going to Acts chapter 4. And we're looking at uh, verse, verses 29 through 30. But then I'm going to add to it verse 31. So this is Acts chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 29 through 30, but I'm going to add 31. So for that declaration, Lord, give us boldness to declare your word. Because after we've gone through this whole process, revive your work in me. Have mercy on me. Create in me a clean heart. Uh, let me let your will be done to me. Show me your ways that I may know you. Keep me from evil. Give me peace. Renew my strength. Fill me with love. Now I'm saying give us the boldness, not just me. Because it's collective. Remember, Yom Kippur is about the whole community coming together. Lord, give us the boldness to declare your word. So here we are in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 30. And this is where this declaration comes from. And it reads, so now, Lord, take note of their threats. Because this is after they had been um, beaten uh, for declaring Yeshua's name. So now, Lord, take note of their threats. Enable your slaves, other versions say your servants, to speak your message with boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal, to heal and to do signs and miracles through the name of your holy servant, Yeshua. Now, that's where that declaration comes from. But look at verse 31, as we are laying bare the foundations. It says, while they were still praying, the place where they were gathered was shaken. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, and they spoke God's message with boldness. Now, the boldness came after the shaking. Now, this is a big deal that we've got to understand because, again, the, the message today is about laying bare the foundations. God will shake everything that can be shaken. And there's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 12 that talks about the shaking. And this is a big deal, especially as we're going through a natural storm right now. And our nation is going through many, many storms recently. As we get closer and closer to Yeshua's return, we see that the storms and natural disasters, they are all ramping up. There's more and more and more and more because the foundations of the earth are being laid bare. What is at the surface is being removed so that we can really see what's going on underneath. And that's important because it empowers us as intercessors to rightly pray. We need to know what's under the surface. We need to know what's at the foundation, at the heart, at the soul of our nation. 
as I was speaking of on Wednesday's Bible study. We've got to know what's at the soul of our nation so that we can pray rightly, so that we can confess those sins to God, so we can ask him to bind up those demons and send them to dry every places. So the shaking has to happen, but it has to happen with us first. Peter says that the judgment begin first with the house of God. So God has to shake his people first. And in the 10 days of all, I'm allowing him to shake me. I'm not trying to be comfortable. I'm not trying to, to, to do what feels good to me. Instead, I'm allowing God to reveal some stuff. I'm allowing him to shake me so that that which is not of his kingdom is removed. And this takes us right to Hebrews chapter 12, because that's what the shaking is all about. Now, the writer of Hebrews, he starts with recounting what happened in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. In Exodus chapters 19 and 20, the children of Israel have come to the base of Mount Sinai. And they are at Mount Sinai, actually on the very first Shavuot, which is the Feast of Weeks or also known as Pentecost. They are at the base of Mount Sinai, the first Shavuot, and a shofar sounds in the heavenly realm. And this was not a teruah blast because it wasn't Yom Teruah. It was a, a, a Kadiyah Hagadol. And so it's, it's Hagadola. It's, it's this, this, this blast of Kadiyah. Takiya Hagadola. The Takiya Hagadola is a blast that just gets louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And you hear them describing it in Exodus chapter 19, this blast that gets louder and louder and louder and louder and it shakes the foundation of the mountains. The mountains are shaken because of this shofar blast, this heavenly shofar blast. And then the presence of God comes down with fire and thunder and lightning and then a voice, and he calls Moses up. And then the people say, you go up, because we're not going up. He might, we might die if we go up. You go and talk to God. We're not going to talk to God. And so the Hebrews writer here in Hebrews chapter 12, he talks about that experience, that they were approaching that mountain that was being shaken by this, this shofar blast, this Takiyah Hagadola, this, 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 this grand shofar blast that shook everything. And, and he says to us, that something different is happening, starting in verse 22 down to the end. It says, on the contrary, you have come to Mount Zion. See, we're not come to Mount Sinai where the law is given. We come to Mount, si Mount Zion where the redemption is given. So you have come to Mount Zion, that is the city of the living God. Heavenly Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, which means the cities of Shalom to myriads of angels in festive assembly, to a community of the firstborn whose names have been recorded in heaven. See, our names are in the book of life. This is what he's talking about. That is the fulfillment of Yom Kippur, that our names are recorded in heaven. They're in the book of life. We will not be judged or purged out of God's presence, right? This is where we've come, to this community of believers, to a judge, that word there is Elohim, what we've been talking about this whole time, to a judge, to Elohim, who is God of everyone to spirits of righteous people who've been brought to the goal, meaning they have they've walked their faith out to the fullness of it and achieved this salvation, this redemption that they've waited for, to the mediator of a new covenant, Yeshua, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better things than that of Havel, which is Abel, because he had just spoken of Abel's blood that cried out from the ground, because it does, that blood, that, that, that innocent blood that, that falls on the ground. It cries out to God and it causes earth's foundations to be shaken. And he's saying, but Messiah's blood speaks out even louder than the cries of the innocent blood that has been shed on the ground because Messiah's blood speaks redemption as opposed to Abel's blood and every other person that was killed that was innocent. Their blood speaks out judge, judgment, bring judgment, avenge me. Well, Yeshua's blood says it's already been paid. Watch this, verse 25. See that you don't reject the one speaking. This is still Hebrews chapter 12. For if those did not escape who rejected him when he gave divine warning on earth, that's at Mount Sinai, think how much less we will escape if we turn away from him when he warns us from heaven. Even then his voice shook the earth. But now he has made this promise. One more time I will shake not only the earth, but heaven too. And this phrase one more time makes clear that the things shaken are removed since they are created things so that the things not shaken may remain. Therefore, since we have received an unshakable kingdom, let us have grace through which we may offer service that will please God with reverence and fear for indeed our God is a consuming fire. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us is that God is shaking the heavens and the earth because he is preparing it 
for the time of redemption. The king is coming. Yom Teruah will be fulfilled. He told us in Matthew chapter 5 that he didn't come to abolish the Torah or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And he will fulfill Yom Teruah. That is the Torah. When he comes to fulfill it, the enemies of, the God, of God are going to melt away. Then Yom Kippur is going to be fulfilled. There will be a final judgment, not just of humans, but also of demons. If you go back to Revelation chapter 20 and go one verse earlier, in verse 10, it talks about Satan being thrown into the lake of fire. He is going to. Then also death, hell, the grave, all of it is going into the lake of fire. And it's because he's preparing really for Sukkot. Sukkot is Revelation chapter 21 where God's dwelling is with his people forever. There has to be a Yom Kippur, a judgment, a purging, before there can be a Sukkot, a final dwelling with God forever and ever and ever. So Sukkot then goes into a perpetual Shabbat, which I've talked about this whole time, where we have Shabbat Shalom forever. But in order to have a perpetual Shalom, there has to first be a purging of the things that will make us cry. And that's what he says in Revelation 21, that he removes everything that will cause mourning or crying or pain. And the old order completely passes away. Now, this Hebrews writer is in telling us, since we know all of this and we are connected with a kingdom that is unshakable, we must obey the voice of God that is shaking the heavens and the earth. Now, how do I obey? I come to Mount Zion. That's where the temple mount stood. That is the place of the sacrifice. That is also where Yeshua was crucified. I go to Mount Zion, honestly laying bare my soul so that he can tell me my sins, my issues. And don't think you can figure them out yourself because our mind can trick us into thinking we have not sinned. It can rationalize our sin, not to mention we can be committing and connected to sins that are part of our culture or our family line that we don't even see as sins because everyone else around us is doing them. We sin every single day and sin is any, anything that is outside of the perfect will of God for your life. Anything that is outside of his perfect will for you is sin. Every day we do and think things that are outside of God's perfect will for our life. Every day we need atonement. And so the Hebrews writer is telling us, let us let him shake us so that everything that's not a part of the kingdom that is within us can be shaken off of us. Because if we judge ourselves, then we won't be judged. So this is why judgment comes on the house of God first. Judgment comes on the house of God first so that we might allow him to shake us free of everything that he is coming to rid the earth of so that it won't be found in us. It won't, we won't have a part in it so that instead we can be caught up together with him and meet him in the air because it's no longer in us because he's removed it. He's atoned for it and he sent all the demons that are connected to it. He sent them into dry arid places out of our lives, out of our souls, out of our nation. Now, watch this. We got to go to Matthew. Because I want you to see how important this is in our relationship with Yeshua, the things that are going to be shaken. So Matthew chapter 7, and I'm going to read verses 24 through 27. And it says, so everyone, and this is the Lord speaking, Yeshua is speaking. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on bedrock. The rain fell, the rivers flooded, the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not collapse because its foundation was on rock. But everyone here who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a stupid man, that's what the complete Jewish says, <laughs> who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the rivers flooded, the wind blew and beat against that house and it collapsed. And its collapse was horrendous. Now, this is key. It's important that we get this because what he's telling us is that a shaking is coming. This matches up with what we just saw in Hebrews chapter 12. A shaking is coming. If we are not careful, that which we are still connected with will collapse and will collapse with it. Our faith, if our faith is not rooted and grounded in the Lord alone, not in the ways he does things to us and for us and, and all of that. If it's not just rooted and grounded in just him, just him. Just love of him, just believing in him, just trusting him. But if it's rooted and grounded in anything else, like what he does for us, how he does it for us, what people do around us, you know, what we think about ourselves, if it's rooted in anything else, our religion, our religious leaders, all that's going to be shaken. 
all of that is going to be shaken. What will last is his words to us, the Bible, the scriptures. What will last is our relationship with him. What will last is our redemption, which is what the scriptures are all about. That's going to last the shaking. That's going to last the storm. Now we see in North Carolina in the natural how serious a storm can be, the damage that a storm can do, not just the property, but loss of life. Similarly, the storms of our lives can do the same thing. Storms in your life can cause you not only to lose things that you hold dear, possessions that are important to you, even marriages and family uh, uh, cohesion that's important to you, but you can lose your, your own eternal salvation, your own life if you lose faith in the midst of natural storms. And these natural storms are part of the shaking, the storms in the weather and the storms in our lives. They are a part of the shaking and we can't allow the shaking to shake our faith because our faith has to be rooted in the rock, it has to be rooted in the word of God, it has to be rooted in our relationship with God and what he promised us through his word. No matter how it manifests, no matter how it looks, it has to be rooted in who he is, in his character, not in circumstances or things outside of us because the things outside of us will be shaken, which means they can change at any given moment. We have no idea how things can change quickly. One day we can be at peace. The next day we can be at war. I was watching Pearl Harbor yesterday. Everyone was just lulled into peace and sleep and thought that they were, nothing could touch them. And the next day, the next morning on Sunday morning, hundreds, thousands of people were dying. There's still over 1100 men entombed in the Arizona, the battleship that flipped over in uh, Pearl Harbor. Still, they never got them out. That's, that's just the men they didn't get out. There were countless dead in the water, countless dead everywhere else. And the, the day before that, everyone was at peace. Our lives can be just like that. They can be peaceful one day and the next day, all types of things can go wrong. Because if our faith is rooted in what's happening, we will, not only will the house fall down, meaning everything around us, but we will lose our souls in the process. And that is not God's will for us, which is why he tells us to be rooted in his rock. And this is how we apply the word of God is being rooted in him. Not just doing for the sake of doing. It's not religious. It's not legalistic. We, we, we apply God's word by first meditating on it in our heart, by digesting it, going over it, asking him to help us make it one with ourselves. That's the new covenant. According to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, is that the Torah is written on our hearts and our minds. It's inside of us. It becomes a part of us. And that's how I'm rooted and grounded in my faith. That's how I build on the rock. This is how I make sure that I am not shaken when the foundation is laid bare. Now we are coming upon Yom Kippur and in order for us to really facilitate national deliverance, because remember this is not just about ourselves. In order for us to facilitate national deliverance, we have to lay bare the foundations of our nations. When I shared the Bible study on Wednesday, and I said, um, we talked about the soul of a nation for, not, for Yom Kippur, I read an excerpt from um, Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural speech, which is on the north wall of the Lincoln Memorial. That's where I first saw it. I actually read the whole thing there, and I was amazed. Um, and, I, and I actually read an excerpt of it in the Bible study on Wednesday. So if you didn't watch it, go back and watch that. It will bless you. Um, um, on the soul of a nation, God speaks on the soul of a nation for Yom Kippur. And what he basically said is both the North and the South, those two armies were both crying out to the same God, praying in the, to the same God and, and reading the same Bible and asking him to help them win. And in what Abraham Lincoln basically summed up is what if God is prolonging this war because he is redeeming every dollar that we got out of slavery. He's taking it from us in this war. And he is atoning for every drop of blood of the slaves that we have spilt by all of our lives being lost in this war. And it's like, oh my God. So what he's saying is God is laying bare the foundation of this nation, which is slavery. And he is addressing it in this civil war. Now let's look at our nation. Now, if you're in the United States, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're in a different nation, God is laying bare something else in your nation. But in the United States, he is laying bare the foundation of racism. It is being laid bare. He is revealing it. He is cracking it open because it wasn't just slavery. Slavery was built upon an ideology called race. The entire notion of race was devised specifically to justify slavery. Prior to 
the, the, in, the conception of the transatlantic slave trade, there was no notion of race between humans. The scientific notion of race speaks of a species that can successfully um, procreate. So as long as you're the same spe species and can, can successfully procreate, then you're the same race, meaning all humans are the same race. We're homo sapiens, right? We're all the same species, okay? Now, what happened is that notion of race came forward through Darwin's theory of evolution because he wanted to prove that those that were closest to the cradle of life in Africa were less evolved and those farther away, Europeans and some Asians, were more evolved. So now right above Africa, of course, is Israel. So the two groups he was trying to prove were inferior were Africans and Jews. His entire theory of evolution was for that purpose. So the notion of race was brought forward to justify an institution called slavery. So now while God himself addressed slavery, racism, which was the foundation of this nation, has not been addressed. And we see it bubbling up to the surface right now because God is laying a foundation there. And what else was at that foundation? Commercialism, mammon, Babylon, selling the souls and the, 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 the bodies and souls of men, foundation of this nation. So now God's got to deal with, with our love of money, which is mammon, that love of money, He's got to deal with the notion of race that was created specifically to perpetuate a money-making institution. He's got to deal with our covenant with Babylon, which is, has brought with it witchcraft, the occult, luxuries, decadence, pleasure. All of that is Babylon. So God has to lay that foundation bare and he is exposing it. And it is ugly. And a lot of people don't want to look at it. But that, I mean, that right there, it is. It explains pornography, why we're the leaders, um, the leading exporters of pornography in the world. It explains um, the sex slave trade. It explains why we're importing slaves right now. It explains why we will buy products from countries that use slave labor. All of that is explained because once we uh, gave in to mammon and that spirit of greed, uh, commercialism, uh, uh, to make a dollar no matter what, we made a covenant with Babylon to sell and trade everything, including bodies and souls of men. Everything that comes with Babylon, that whore, that great prostitute also came in. So at the foundation, we see Babylon. And God has to address it because he did not lay that foundation for this nation. He set this nation apart that it would be an exporter of the gospel. And we would take the good news to the four corners of the earth. And we've done that but laced with some other stuff. It was laced with racism. It was laced with commercialism. We, we went conquering and, and imperialist as well with the gospel. So we perverted even the very work he gave us because Babylon was in our foundation. And I shared this at um, Temple Service or, or Priesthood Academy about a week ago where I said that only God, it was Yom Teruah service, it was Yom Teruah, that only God can look at the foundation of something and see that there are things in the foundation that don't need to be there. Only God can pull out the stuff in the foundation that should not be there and replace it with his truth. Only he can do that. But humans, to address a foundation, we have to destroy the entire house. We have to burn it down to address a foundation because we can't get to the entire foundation without disrupting the house, at least. There's times when they will repair a foundation. They're really literally kind of lifting the house up. And there's problems that can happen with the rafters and the roof and, 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 and the beams when you do that, because things kind of get off balance when you do it. But God is so perfect that he can strategically pull out those things in the foundation that shouldn't be there and put in the things that he initially intended to be there. He can put in the rock, Yeshua, who's supposed to be at the foundation of our nation. Now, I say all this to you to say that we have some work to do. Yom Teruah is coming up. Well, Yom Teruah has happened and we entertained it 10 days of all and Yom Kippur is coming up. It's time for us to dress to address the foundation of our nation. God is laying it bare. We are seeing it. The mess is rising up. Look at all the violence, random violence. Why? Because the beast hates Babylon and the beast is going crazy in our country because we represent Babylon. We're not the only one. The West in general represents Babylon. And we see the spirit of, of the beast who hates Babylon going crazy in our land with all this violence is bringing back violence upon our head. Because why? violence was a tactic used to establish this nation. And so it becomes so important 
that we allow God to uproot that from our the, the foundation of our nation. We got to lay the, the foundation of our nation bare before the Lord. And he is using all type of political storms, financial storms, racial tensions, every other type of storm we can think of to reveal to us what's really at the foundation of this nation. Whether we want to accept it or not, God is using the storms to reveal the foundation. We've got to address it. And as his people, we've got to first address ourselves. That's what those 10 days of our are all about. From Yom to Rua to the ninth day, we are looking at ourselves individually and our households. So that on Yom Kippur, we can say, Lord, give us boldness to declare your word. And he can shake the house that we're in and he can give us the words to intercede and pray. And we can go before him in a harp and bowl style of worship where we have, have worship songs and intercessory prayers and then worship songs and intercessory prayers. And we're able to really get into the presence of God. And we can confess the sins of our nation in a worshipful atmosphere and ask our high priest, who is Yeshua, to send those sins and the demons that go with them into dry, arid places so that when he comes back, or even prior to his return, he doesn't have to destroy the United States because we're in opposition to him. That's true for every nation. Every single nation has to do this. And we don't know how many people he needs to intercede in each nation for him to redeem the nation. We don't know how many of us is enough. So each one of us needs to just stand up because what if you are the one that makes a difference? Abraham asked God when he was interceding for Sodom, what if there are 50 righteous there? What if there are 40 righteous there? What if there are 30 righteous there? What if there are 20 righteous there? Then finally, what if there are 10 righteous there? Will you spare it? And the Lord said, if there are 10 righteous there, I will spare it. There weren't 10. You don't know. If you are the one who makes a difference in your nation, you don't know. Messiah has already paid the price. He needs priests now who will actually apply the blood that he's already shed. He needs priests who will call upon him, our high priest, confess those sins and allow him to send them into dry area places. And we can't do this alone. We have to do it together. I'm going to leave you, I'm gonna leave you with a, a, a couple of scriptures um, to really just add, see so that you'll understand what God is trying to do in our hearts. I'm going to take you to Isaiah uh, 45, verses 18 and 19. We were looking at this foundation. And it says, For thus says Adonai, the Lord, who created the heavens and who shaped and made the earth, who established and created it not to be in chaos, but formed it to be lived in. He's talking about the earth. I am Adonai, there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness, I did not say to the descendants of Yaakov or Jacob, it is in vain that you will seek me. I, Adonai, speak rightly and I say what is true. And listen to what he's saying. I made the earth not to be in chaos, but for you to dwell in it, to live, to thrive in the earth. And I did not tell you to seek me in vain. I have not hidden my truths from you. I have spoken plainly, rightly and justly to you, calling you into service that you would be the Elohim I created you to be so that the earth can be what I wanted it to be. Now, this word, he created not to be in chaos because in other versions, you'll see he, that it says he did not create it to be empty. I'm going to take you to Genesis chapter one. And this, will be our, this is our final scripture. Genesis chapter one, where he is forming the earth. It says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was unformed and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. Now that word, the void and darkness in Hebrew is tovu vavovu. Tovu vavovu. That's what that word is. And it does not mean void and darkness. Like in that other version, when we were reading Isaiah 45, it says he didn't create the world to be empty and in darkness. It's not what it means. Tovu vavovu means in chaos. So we see here in verse two that the earth was unformed and in chaos. But verse one says he created it. Well, he created it in chaos. He did it. We see in Revelation that the Lord sends Satan down to the earth. When he sends Satan down to the earth and they say, woe to the earth because Satan has been sent down to you. Satan is the one who creates the chaos. Then the Lord starts to speak light and order into his creation because Satan has brought chaos with him now the scripture we just read isaiah 45 that same word is used there 
He did not create the earth to be in chaos. Tovu vavovu. He didn't create it to be in chaos. He created it to be inhabited, to be lived in by his people. He has given us the dominion on the earth. It is our job to ensure that it does not function in the chaos, the void darkness of the enemy, just like we saw in Psalm 82, that, the, the, that those people that are oppressed, they walk around in darkness. The unrighteous don't even know what makes them sin. They're walking around in darkness because the chaos of the enemy is not just outside of them, inside of them. The chaos, the void, the darkness. But inside of God's children, just like he said in the earth, let there be light inside of us is light. So I want to encourage you to know that apart from God, you can do nothing. But you can do all things through Messiah who strengthens you. And as you address your sin honestly and openly before the Lord, as you allow the foundation of your soul to be laid bare to him during your own personal storms and during these 10 days of all, because the storms kick up all that exterior stuff to show you what the foundation is. It will show you if you truly have faith. It will show you if you truly love God. It will show you if you truly believe you're his son or his daughter. A storm will show you that because that's at your foundation. As your foundation is being laid bare, Reveal it before God and ask him to repair the foundation of your soul during these 10 days of all. And when we come together next Wednesday on Yom Kippur, 10 o'clock will be at York River, 2 o'clock will be at Temple of Peace. We are going to lay bare the foundation of our nation. And we're going to ask God to restore the foundation because he establishes in righteousness and justice. He doesn't establish in chaos. He does not create tovu vovu. Enemy does that. God himself, he can bind those enemies up and send them into dry places and with them the chaos that they bring. All these things we're seeing in our nation, the sin, the, the racial tensions, the, the, the sexual uh, perversion, the children that's being abused, uh, the, the random seemingly violence, all of that is tohu babobu. No, that is not God's will. And it needs to be bound up and sent into dry air places. Because that is what God desires. And he's given us the authority to do it. If we just call out to him. Because he gave the earth to us that we might dwell in it. And we will welcome him to return. Because he wants to dwell with us forever. That's Sukkot. And that's why Yom Kippur must come before Sukkot. Because he will do all the purging. And then he'll live with us in peace and shalom perpetually. Every day will be Shabbat Shalom. It will all be a Shabbat. We'll have Shalom forever. That's the eighth day of Sukkot. Sukkot is a seven-day wedding feast. And it's the eighth day that's Shalom. And it's Shalom forever because he makes all things new. The eighth day is the new day, which is Shabbat forever. And Hebrews tells us that there is still a Shabbat Shalom for God's people. And that will be fulfilled when we dwell with him. I pray that that encouraged you. I pray that you'll share this with others because we have to take it seriously. We're seeing all the signs, but we're not responding rightly. God needs us to rise up as his people and respond rightly. First, to the condition of our own souls and the condition of our nation. So let that encourage you. Plan to join us next Wednesday. Um, Yom Kippur starts sundown Tuesday, September 18th. So your fast should start then. Sundown is at 7-11, 7 p.m. 7-11 p.m. <laughs> and then the next day, September 19th, Yom Kippur continues. At 10 a.m. we'll be at the York River. At 2 p.m. we'll be at Temple of Peace Church, um, 3115 Wickham Avenue in Newport News, Virginia. And we will be there until sundown again, where we'll have communion at 7, 11 p.m. on Wednesday, September 19th. And we'll eat together so no one goes home, you know, empty. Be hydrating now because Yom Kippur is absolute no water, no food fast. And so make sure you're hydrating. Hydrate today. Take water with you. I got water with me all day. Just carrying water bottles around. Tomorrow, same thing. Wean off the food, eat less and less food, but drink lots of water. So you won't already be dehydrated. Most of us walk around dehydrated all the time and we don't even realize we're dehydrated. So drink water regularly for these next three days. And then on Wednesday or Tuesday sundown, you'll be able to go into a fast without your body going into terrible shock because dehydration can really be serious. Um, so you, you want to allow God to prepare you for it. Wean off the food, drink lots of water. Also want to encourage you, that we are preparing for Sukkot, which is one of our most expensive festivals. We need your financial support. Even though we didn't have service today, 
We still need you to give your tithes, your offerings, your monthly partnerships, and special gifts as we're preparing for the feast days. And you can do it online at truthinspirit.org. Just click donate and you can give right then via PayPal or with your credit card because we've got a lot to do. God has given us a lot to do. And so please bless us with your support and with your fellowship and allow him to prepare you even now for the Shayla Meme offering for Sukkot um, so that you can bless him in accordance with the way he has blessed you. That's what Shayla Meme is for. Deuteronomy 18, 18 tells us to come before the Lord three times a year and not come empty handed. That's the Shayla Meme. Um, it's doing Passover and Unleavened Bread. Uh, Shavuot, which is also Pentecost, Feast of Weeks, and Sukkot. Those are the three where we bring him to share the name. And so allow him to minister to you and prepare you for that so that you can be in obedience in, in, in these areas he's revealing to us that he can pour out all of the blessings that he's prepared for us. They're not just for us. He blesses us to be a blessing. He wants to bless our communities, our neighborhoods, our nations, and he's chosen you and me to do it. I hope that that just really blessed you. And if you have questions, email me at info at truthandspirit.org. But know also there's lots of information on our website, truthandspirit.org. You click any one of the feast day celebrations, it'll take you to a page that gives you all types of scriptures and understanding about the feast so that you can say amen as you're joining us and you're not doing it um, in a place of confusion. You want to be in a place of understanding so that you can agree. And that is a beautiful blessing unto God. Again, I pray that blessed you, and I want to pray with you that he can minister to and through all of us as we're preparing for what he wants to do. So, Father, we just lift you up, and we thank you for revealing the truth to us, Lord God. Sometimes the truth is hard to face. Sometimes it's hard to bear that the foundations uh, have been undermined, that righteousness and justice that you placed in the foundation of the earth and in the foundation of the nation, in the foundation of our lives, it's been undermined by our own sin and the sin of others around us and who came before us. But it is the truth. And so we ask that you help us to, to see that truth with open eyes and that we would not be condemned. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those of Messiah Yeshua. We bind up condemnation even now and we cast that plan of the enemy to condemn us to the ground. We thank you even now, Lord God, that as we confess our sins, you are righteous and just to forgive us. We are not condemned. We are not cast off. And there is no fear in confessing sin. There is a relief and a redemption because you have already prayed, paid the price for our sin. We apply the blood of Messiah even now. And we thank you for the redemption, Lord God, that comes for the fact that he has atoned for our sins. You're applying his blood and he himself will deliver us. We praise you for it and we bless you that it's being done even now. Continue to bless the families that have been affected by this storm and allow us to come together and to support one another that each one may be built up in our most holy faith we praise you for it and we thank you for it. We ask also that you put on our hearts and minds those in our lives that are not yet saved, those who have not received that atoning blood of Messiah Yeshua and the redemption that, that, that is revealed by the, the filling of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you help us to lift them up in prayer, help us to be in the right position in relationship with them, that we might share the gospel and that we might intercede on their behalf and that we might be light in their lives, not condemning them, not judging them, but judging actions, judging motivations and revealing the enemy who is at work. We thank you for giving us discerning wisdom that we might be right judges, right Elohim in the earth as we pattern ourselves after the, the example that you have set for us. We thank you for it and we praise you for it. And that's for a blessing for all those that are watching this video and will watch it in the future. We praise you, Lord God, for just a hedge of protection all about them, a bloodline all around them, that they can learn these truths that you are revealing in a place of safety, without the retribution of the enemy. I thank you that you push back the hands of the enemy and protect us all from evil. Keep us from evil, protect us from the evil one in the name of the sure Lord God, that we might learn your truth, Lord, hallelujah, Lord, in safety and in solace and comfort in you. And then we may go forth and do your work. We praise you for it and we bless you for that. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. God bless you all. And I do hope to see you at Yom Tavua service.